on World News Tonight. Back to business. Liz Truss wastes no time in shutting down the opposition and outlining the way forward as a nation. New revelations. The tables turn on Trump's legal victory as the FBI reveals concerning reports on foreign nuclear power documents found in the Mar-a-Lago home. Energy emergency. Despite Russia's stern opposition, the European Union is mulling a price cap on fuel supply to better manage the crisis to come. And Apple awesomeness. The iPhone takes center stage with its latest upgrades that revolutionize the tech industry. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. At a first parliamentary grilling as British Prime Minister, Liz Truss confirmed plans to stem huge rises in the cost of energy. The appointed cabinet is particularly significant due to the degree of diversity in key roles. Ranil Jaiwardhana, who is of Sri Lankan origin, was appointed Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs of the United Kingdom. Setting a new tone for Prime Minister's questions at the House of Commons. In her first sparring session in Parliament, Liz Truss kept her responses serious, businesslike, policy focused. And in her first challenge from opposition leader Keir Starmer, Truss ruled out a windfall tax on energy corporations. The last time we cut corporation tax, we attracted more revenue. And if taxes are put up, and raised to the same level as France, it'll put off uh, those companies investing in our economy, and ultimately that will mean fewer jobs, less growth, and less opportunities across our country. Gone were the theatrics of her predecessor, Boris Johnson, as Truss gave direct answers to Starmer's questions, but she did manage a few jokes at the opposition leader's expense. There is nothing new about the Tory fantasy of trickle-down economics. There's nothing new about a Tory Prime Minister who, when asked who pays, says it's you, the working people of Britain. Well, there's nothing new about a Labour leader who is calling for more tax rises. Truss vowed to help all Britons with skyrocketing energy bills, but she withheld the details. Her plan to tackle the energy crisis is to be delivered on Thursday. Wednesday's PMQs came after Truss held her first meeting with a new cabinet, which, for the first time ever, features no white males in the top jobs. Introducing Therese Coffey, Health Minister and Deputy PM. Kwasi Kwarteng, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Foreign Secretary James Cleverley. And Suella Braverman, Home Secretary. A cabinet diverse both in race and in gender, and united with Truss in their staunchly free market views. Donald Trump is now under fire for new developments regarding the search of his Mar-a-Lago home. The FBI was informed that they have found concerning documents detailing nuclear capabilities of foreign nations. Tonight, new fallout after an explosive report that is part of the seizure of documents at former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home last month. FBI agents, according to the Washington Post, found a document describing a foreign government's military defenses, including its nuclear capabilities. The Post, citing people familiar with the matter, also reports some of the documents detail top-secret U.S. operations, so closely guarded that many senior national security officials are kept in the dark about them. Documents on such highly classified operations require special clearance on a need-to-know basis, not just top-secret clearance. Materials often kept under lock and key. Tonight, Mr. Trump's former acting defense secretary, Mark Esper, criticizing his former boss. It's very, very troubling that this type of information would be would be there or anywhere for that matter. 300 classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago, and that simply should have never happened in the first place. Mr. Trump has blasted the investigation as an effort to distract from President Biden's record on inflation and crime. Tonight, top Republicans are questioning the need for the Mar-a-Lago search and slamming the investigation. Despite the long wait, former U.S. President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama both made their return to the White House in a long-standing tradition that is considered one of the highlights of many leaders' tenures. The couple unveiled their official portraits today. And when future generations walk these halls and look up at these portraits, I hope they get a better, honest sense of who Michelle and I were. 
Yes. <laughs> Barack Obama and his wife, former First Lady Michelle Obama, returned to the White House for the unveiling of their official portraits, more than five years after the former president left office. The event on Wednesday was hosted by current U.S. President Joe Biden, who served two terms as Obama's vice president. There are few people I've ever known with more integrity, decency, and moral courage than Barack Obama. Nothing could have prepared me better or more to become president of the United States than be at your side for eight years. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Obama, in turn, praised the current commander in chief. Thanks to your decency and thanks to your strength, Maybe most of all, thanks to your faith in our democracy and the American people. The country's better off than when you took office, and we should all be deeply grateful for that. Artist Robert McCurdy put a gray-suited Obama at the center of his canvas in a photorealistic portrait with a white background. Michelle Obama and her portrait is pictured in a blue dress in the White House's Red Room in a painting by Brooklyn artist Sharon Sprung. The former first lady reflected on the larger impact the couple's portraits may have. What we are seeing is a reminder that there's a place for everyone in this country. That's why for me this day isn't about me or Barack. It's not even about these beautiful paintings. It's about telling that fuller story, a story that includes every single American in every single corner of the country so that our kids and grandkids can see something more for themselves. Usually. A former president returns for the portrait unveiling during his successor's tenure. But Donald Trump's administration did not hold a ceremony for the Obamas. Trump, before winning the 2016 election and succeeding Obama, was a longtime proponent of the Bertha movement that falsely suggested Obama was not born in the United States and should not be president. Large formal portraits of U.S. presidents and first ladies adorn walls, hallways, and rooms throughout the White House. The final suspect in a stabbing rampage that killed 10 people in and around a Canadian Indigenous reserve has been reported dead after his car was run off the road by police following a three-day manhunt. Three days after one of the deadliest attacks in Canadian history, the multi-province manhunt for the last remaining suspect is over. But there was one final twist in the tale. Police arrested Miles Sanderson for Sunday stabbing attacks that left 10 people dead, only for Sanderson himself to die from self-inflicted injuries shortly after. Miles Sanderson had evaded police capture for days, with varying reports of sightings of him across Saskatchewan province. The other suspect in the killings, his brother Damien Sanderson, was found dead on Monday near the stabbing sites. Police are investigating whether Miles was responsible. Sanderson was no stranger to the law. He had been wanted by police for parole violations months ago and had 59 convictions on his record, many of which were violent. According to court reports, he attacked and stabbed one of the victims killed in the weekend's rampage seven years ago. Questions are now being asked as to why he was out on the streets in the first place. The government's public safety minister has said there will be an investigation into the parole board's assessment of Sanderson. For the relatives of those who lost loved ones, it's a dramatic end to days of anguish. President Vladimir Putin attended large-scale military exercises involving China and several Russia-friendly countries as Moscow seeks to strengthen partnerships in Asia in the face of Western sanctions. Russia has found itself increasingly isolated as tensions between Moscow and Western capitals soared since Russia sent troops into pro-Western Ukraine. A week-long showcase of military might. Russia's large-scale exercises with China have not shied away from flexing muscle, deploying over 50,000 soldiers and more than 5,000 units of military equipment. The drills, codenamed Vostok 2022, are being held in Russia's far east and off the Japanese coast, a sign that Moscow is edging closer to its ally Beijing. The practical interaction between the Russian Navy and the Navy of the China's People's Liberation Army has reached a new level in terms of quality. This ensures global and regional stability and security. The show of force comes as the Kremlin seeks to bolster ties with China in the face of unprecedented Western sanctions over its invasion of Ukraine. The two countries have drawn closer in recent years, ramping up their so-called no-limits relationship, acting as a counterweight to the United States.
Since Russia's invasion, China has refused to criticize the Kremlin's actions, blaming the U.S. and NATO for provoking Moscow. In turn, Moscow expressed its solidarity with Beijing during a visit of U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi in Taiwan in August. In a continuation of the rapprochement, President Vladimir Putin is expected to meet his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping at a summit in Uzbekistan next week. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News. Russia's stern opposition is disregarded as the EU prepares to announce a price cap on gas provided by Russia to the bloc. The move will be made in hopes of better managing the looming economic crisis in the Eurozone and also to deal a blow to Russia's revenue. The European Commission will propose a price cap on Russian gas. That was the message from Commission President Ursula von der Leyen on Wednesday. Some EU countries are wary over the move as they fear it could cost them the already lower supply they are receiving from Moscow. Russian President Vladimir Putin warned Wednesday his country would stop supplying gas and oil if price caps were imposed. But von der Leyen says Europe must not be cowed. We all know that our sanctions are deeply grinding into the Russian economy with a heavy negative impact. But Putin is partially buffering through fossil fuel revenues. So here the objective is we must cut Russia's revenues, which Putin uses to finance his atrocious war in Ukraine. Von der Leyen also talked of other measures to cope with the energy crisis. That included proposals to lower soaring power prices, partly by capping the amount paid for energy from renewables and other non-gas sources. It is now time for the consumers to benefit from the low costs of low carbon sources, like for example the renewables, we will propose to rechannel these unexpected profits. We channel them to the member states so that the member states can support the vulnerable households and vulnerable companies. Renewable and nuclear energy hasn't been affected by the gas price surge, but their operators have raked in profits as wholesale prices for energy jumped. Von der Leyen said oil and gas firms that have posted huge jumps in profits would also be required to make a solidarity contribution. Energy ministers from the bloc will discuss the proposals at an emergency meeting on Friday. Ukraine is on the agenda along with COVID-19 in Prague, where EU health ministers gathered to plan ahead on controlling the pandemic. The leaders also discussed assistant measures for Ukraine and also on cancer. Ukraine and COVID top the agenda in Prague, where EU health ministers are meeting to discuss priorities for the bloc in the coming months and years. Delegates are trying to agree on how best to provide health care for Ukrainian refugees in EU states, and they're also debating the reconstruction of Ukraine's health infrastructure after the war. We will start with Ukraine, because we all know we need a global strategy for health. And uh, Ukraine should be part of that global uh, strategy because Ukraine is our neighbor and we have to stand with Ukraine. And as Europe braces for the possibility of another COVID wave, plans are in place for the next vaccination program. We now have uh, the new adapted vaccines available to all member states. Vaccination remains key and we need to, as quickly as possible, provide the booster doses to those eligible, but also uh, provide primary vaccination for those who are not vaccinated. Also high on the agenda are the latest developments on an EU initiative to fight cancer. The Europe Beating Cancer Plan focuses on prevention, early detection, treatment and quality of life of cancer patients and survivors. President Jair Bolsonaro presided over a military parade marking 200 years since Brazil's independence, kicking off a day of elaborate festivities that critics accused the far-right leader of hijacking to bolster his re-election campaign. Millions of Brazilians took to the streets to celebrate 200 years of independence from Portugal. And as the military tanks rolled onto the streets for colorful parades, repeated every 7th of September, President Jair Bolsonaro took the opportunity to ask his followers to make a stand in an apparent move to twist the national holiday toward partisan ends. 
So, the Brazilian people are taken to the streets today to celebrate 200 years of independence and an eternity of freedom. What is at stake is our freedom and our future. Just one month ahead of the presidential elections, Bolsonaro now decided to host his Portuguese counterpart in a stark contrast to last July when the European leader visited Brazil and was snubbed by Bolsonaro for meeting with former president Lula da Silva. It went very well in keeping with Brazil's 200-year history. I took the opportunity to tell the story of Dom Pedro, the life of Dom Pedro, and that was a great starting point. We spoke about the 200 years and how Brazil has been asserting itself over these 200 years. Although Independence Day is supposed to be a non-partisan national holiday in Brazil, the right-wing populist president has often referred to it as a key milestone in his re-election campaign, telling his die-hard supporters to prepare to give their lives on this day. An escalation in rhetoric, even for the outspoken populist leader. While most of the country and its inhabitants are affected by mass flooding in Pakistan, pregnant women are particularly vulnerable as they depart on dangerous journeys to make it to safer areas in order to give birth, risking diseases and physical injuries. Only about 900 of more than 100,000 pregnant women displaced by the ongoing and massive floods across Pakistan's Sindh province have made it to relief camps, according to data from the provincial government released on Tuesday and it's raising fears of births in harrowing conditions. The record monsoon rains and melting glaciers in Pakistan's northern mountains have brought floods that have affected 33 million people and killed more than 1,300, including 458 children. About a third of the country has been hit. The relief effort is a huge burden for an economy already needing help from the International Monetary Fund. This is the civil hospital Dadu of Dadu City, which says it has been overwhelmed with more than 72,000 patients in recent days. Pediatrician Dr. Ala Baks Karejo has been among the team treating some 5,000 children with diarrhea. Because of the rains, the cases of diarrhea, malaria and gastric illnesses have increased in Dadu district. We are admitting around 100 cases of diarrhea and around five to six cases of malaria every day. The uptick in diarrhea is because of the accumulation of dirty water. The United Nations has called for $160 million in aid to help the flood victims. But Finance Minister Miftar Ismail said the damage was far higher, telling the US news network CNBC that the total was closer to 10 billion, if not more. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A large fire at a karaoke bar has left dozens dead in Vietnam. It was reported that at least 32 were killed and 11 injured in a fire at a three-story building near Ho Chi Minh City. According to a study published by Nature, an ancient human skeleton has revealed the oldest known case of surgical amputation. It follows the discovery of a 31,000-year-old skeleton of a youth on Indonesia's Borneo Island. A year after El Salvador adopted Bitcoin as legal tender, the area where the world's first cryptocurrency city was meant to be built, a circular metropolis powered by a volcano, is still a dense jungle. A judge ruled that Elon Musk can use a whistleblower claim in his legal case against Twitter, but the billionaire can't delay a trial over his attempt to terminate his $44 billion deal of the company. The Red Cross said at least 15 people died in western Uganda after their homes were buried in a landslide triggered by torrential rains as emergency workers shoveled through mud in search of survivors.
And that's all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you have missed any of the stories tonight, you can re-watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with visuals of the launch of technology's latest marvel, the iPhone 14. Apple introduced the product along with its newest accessories loaded with brand new features. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.